All right, so this is just going to be a video, basically just introduc introducing uh, some of the main, the fundamental concepts of Alfred Korzybski's general semantics. Um, general semantics is a system that will that will train us to to better to make better evaluations, and uh, I guess a really simple way of saying it is just sort of be more conscious to expand our consciousness of the evaluations and the judgments and the everyday observations that we make and being uh, more aware of the process of our perception and the process process of abstraction but we'll get into that uh, here's a, a broad definition from Steve Stockdale of what general semantics is or does General semantics deals with the process of how we perceive, construct, evaluate, and respond to our life experiences. Our language behaviors represent one aspect of these responses. So, uh, so basically, it, yeah, it trains us to be more aware of the subjective nature of our experience and how we, the role we play as an active participant in our perception of quote unquote reality or you know the world out there so let's just jump right in and first just say something about what Korzybski means by science he doesn't mean scientism and you know the kind of idea that science has the answers you know you, you look to science for a truth or it's more about questioning and the scientific approach of constantly questioning, being skeptical, and then applying that not just in the hard sciences, but in the soft sciences and in our everyday life and how we communicate with people and uh, those kind of kinds of everyday experience. So here's a quote from the Institute of General Semantics website. A scientific approach involves the process of continually testing your assumptions and beliefs gathering as many facts and as much data as possible, revising your assumptions and beliefs as appropriate, and holding your conclusions and judgments tentatively. And that's what Korzybski means by science, and that's how he thinks that science um, as, an, as an approach can lead to sane or sanity, less insane behavior. And where he started, the question he started with when he started the work on science and sanity was why is there this disparity between our amazing improvement in technological advance but no equivalent improvement in our sociological advancements? Why do we still have these um, sometimes insane belief systems and ideologies that can D divide us up, have us at, at war with each other constantly. Nobody can get along. I, I mean, it's it's the the number one thing that holds back all of the positive that comes from what we can do as a, you know as a human. And so let's just get right in the first concept of what what Korzybski thinks makes us human. What that distinction is and he calls it time binding uh, that's time binding is something that it, it's a name Korzybski gives to a quality or uh, something that defines us as humans and so it, it's the definitively human activity of transmitting knowledge from one generation to the next and we do this through symbols so and this, uh, you know, is the basis of culture. And just to kind of give, you know, a real sense of how important culture is in defining us, or at least in separating us and dividing us into all these little factions as humans. Uh, here's a quote from the zoologist and anthropologist Desmond Morris. Uh, he wrote the book the Naked Ape, that's his most popular book, but this comes from a book called The Human Zoo. And he says, if it were possible with the aid of a time machine to take a newborn child of an Ice Age hunter and rear it as your own, 
it is doubtful anyone would detect the deception. I think that quote just brings home how important culture, our cultural programming is in our, the way we act and the way we think, our worldview and our belief systems. And this is obviously what divides us at the same time as bringing us all these amazing technologies and all this progress. Um, I mean, a dog from China, you get together that dog with a dog from India and a dog from Canada, and all those dogs are gonna, you know, understand each other. They're not gonna have, you're not, they're not gonna have a communication trouble they're not going to misinterpret each other's language or, or each other's intentions they're not going to go to war you know the dogs from this side of town aren't going to all band together under some idea in war against the dogs in the next side of the town so it's just we could see that there's positive and negatives and what Korzybski is basically thinking and saying is that the scientific approach that we ta talked about earlier evaluating um, constantly testing our beliefs and you know uh, our evaluations that that is the essence of time binding that that is just using our advantage using this this evolutionary tool that we've been given that we've somehow developed that other animals don't have and using it to our evolutionary advantage instead of uh, using it to our evolutionary disadvantage and to the disadvantage of the whole ecosystem and the planet now the way that it's been going so Korzybski thought that the way that this is possible how we do this how we're able to time bind what gives us uh, this ability of time binding over the other animals um, he says man may become conscious of abstracting while animals cannot. To be conscious of abstracting, the nervous system must be extended by extra neural means. So, to kind of talk about this, it's if you know any of the ideas of Marshall McLuhan, it really helps here. Marshall McLuhan was a media theorist, and he basically talked about how all of the, our media are extensions of ourselves just or all of our tools in general the wheel you know he gives the example of the wheel is an extension of the foot the telescope is an extension of the eye uh, the book is an extension of the eye because you can read on the page about scenes and you can imagine them in your head and so he says that language itself as a tool as a technology that we developed is an actual extension of our own nervous system or you could say brain Alfred Krzyzewski likes to say nervous system to refer to not just the part in your head but your whole your you know your whole brain your whole the brain of your body which is your nervous system and so Marshall McLuhan is very had the same kind of idea as Krzyzewski here um, I, I don't know I don't not, I don't think he was influenced by Krzyzewski but they were on the same thing where they're basically thinking that through this extension of our nervous system, it sort of allowed us to create this analog or this map of reality where we could communicate with each other about reality through these m abstractions, these models. McLuhan said, language is an extension of the human nervous system. It is the extension of man in speech that enables the intellect to detach itself from the vastly wider reality. Language extends and amplifies man, but also divides his attention. This is the abstracting model, and this is going to be one of the most important tools, visual tools, for getting really getting to the heart of Korzybski's ideas and uh, knowing what general semantics is all about. So. This is sort of just a model um, of the process or the stages or the steps 
of our immediate of our percept how we go from a reality or so-called reality you know something objectively outside of us that hits our senses we see it how it goes from this happening to something that we are sensing and seeing something we perceive into something we evaluate into something we talk about and this happens so fast constantly in everyday everything we do this without even being conscious of it and that's the first sort of step or thing that you're going to want to get to thinking about and being conscious of the general semantics wants you to be conscious of is consciousness of your abstracting process so we see with this model um, number one something happens so this is outside say you're walking on the road you look there's obviously there you see a tree so something is outside of you that caused you to see this tree it's the tree whatever the real tree is outside of your body this is infinite or unlimited that you could say there's no limit to things you could say about that tree uh, which is why we got this parabola here with those little stars and moons and it's torn off you can see the top that's just to represent the allness this concept of allness that no matter what how seemingly simple an object is or small or no matter what it's it could be a grain of sand and there's an infinite amount of information that could be said about that grain of sand i mean it really just depends on how far you want to go into it to the molecular structure to every you know detail about this grain of sand its relationship to the whole rest of the entire universe is it's the the world it's the, i mean basically Korzybski's coming from a basic philosophy a, a process philosophy that the world is a holistic integrated process and when we verbalize when we use our conceptual system, we, for instance, if we say a tree, we're cutting that tree off from the rest of its environment. We're not taking into account all kinds of information about that tree. We're simplifying our idea into a very basic concept, this leafy brown wooden thing that's growing and living and has leaves and it's a tree we can imagine in our tree and it's just a general idea of a tree but like you could go up to a tree and notice all sorts of details about that tree that you wouldn't be thinking about with just the concept tree or the word tree obviously so something happens outside of you it sends information in the form of light waves, whatever, uh, uh, sound waves, this hits your senses. That's step number two, sensory impact. Your eyeballs get received the light, sound bounces off your eardrums, you feel, you smell, you taste, you touch. Sensory impact. So th this is the first level of abstraction. And so we have to look up at the first one and you see here on the side, we cannot know all that happens. Obviously, we are a limited one person from one perspective. So we don't know all about anything that we're looking at. And secondly, we cannot, s what we sense is not what happened. What we sense is a model that our nervous system built up to present to us to say, yep, here's a basic gist of what's going on. Perception is gamble. It's something that, uh, an idea that Robert Anton Wilson always incorporated into all of his work, that per perception, we don't perceive what's out there, really out there. We perceive a model that our brain has constructed 
from the available information it has, this chaos of information, and it constructs a model that, and then it presents us with this model. And hopefully, this model will help us know how to react. So the next level is evaluation. We hit that, that sensory impact, we have the senses, and then we feel about it. You know, if it's the sensory impact is a hammer to our toe, then it's going to be an immediate feeling. It's not, we're not even, the evaluation isn't even really thinking yet. It's just the immediate idea or the feeling that you get from seeing this image. Is it a, a good feeling? Is it a bad? Or it doesn't have to be feeling. I mean, you could, something you think about this thing, but the point here is this is another abstraction. This is us evaluating our model of something that's happening. So what we describe to ourselves in our evaluation is not what we sensed. This is a, another level of abstraction. And now we're going into the verbal level of abstraction. The fourth level is meaning. Now we infer, we uh, make, we generalize, we put it into categories, we give meaning, come to conclusions, we have uh, an opinion about it, and we verbalize it to each other. This is where we label. And so that would be the fourth. The key in this abstracting model that general semantics wants us to understand is just understanding these this order, the order and all these levels and understanding the difference between a reality outside of us, something that happens or the process level, um, the sensory level, the sensory immediate qualia experience of what we're seeing, our evaluation of it or our attitudes and feelings towards it and then our meaning that we apply, how we verbalize it and how we talk about it how we describe it to others. So this is a long quote, but I want to read this Aldous Huxley quote because it really goes deep into what we're talking about here, why this is important. Um, so he says, what can and what should the individual do to improve his ironically equivocal relationship with the culture which he finds himself embedded. How can he continue to enjoy the, the benefits of culture without at the same time being stupefied or frenziedly intoxicated by its poisons? How can he become discriminative, discriminatingly acculturated, rejecting what is silly or downright evil in his conditioning? and holding fast to that which makes for humane and intelligent behavior. So this is what we were talking about with the, uh, this is the same question Korzybski was asking. How do we take the good and throw out the bad with our symbol, symbolic behavior? And uh, Huxley goes on and says, a culture cannot be discriminatingly accepted, much less be modified, except by persons who have seen through it by persons who have cut holes in the confining stockade of verbalized symbols and so are able to look at the world and by reflection at themselves in a new and relatively unprejudiced unpreju way. Such persons are not merely born, they must also be made. But how? In the field of formal education, what the would-be hole cutter needs is knowledge. Knowledge of the past and present history of cultures and all their fantastic variety and knowledge about the nature and limitations, the uses and abuses of language. A man who knows that there have been many cultures and that each culture claims to be the best and truest of all will find it hard to take too seriously the boastings and dogmatizings of his own tradition. Similar, similarly, a man who knows how symbols are related to experience and who practices the kind of linguistic self-control taught by the exponents of general semantics is unlikely to take too seriously the absurd or dangerous nonsense that within every culture passes for philosophy, practical wisdom, and political argument. Huxley really goes over everything that we've been talking about so far. Um, 
you know, how how to manage, you know, how to not get mind controlled basically by a culture, um, by your own culture, how to not get so wrapped up in your own emic perspective that you don't see what is completely irrational in your behavior or the things about your culture, uh, things that aren't are not beneficial. And he's saying what you need, just like Korzybski was saying, is extension. And how he says it is um, to cut holes in the confining stockade of verbalized symbols and so are able to look at the world and by reflection at themselves in a relatively new way. So you could think about the extension of ourselves as also a way to sort of gain this Archimedean point or you know this perspective this new perspective and Huxley was also you know obviously one of the original sort of popular popularizers or proponents of the use of psychoactive drugs to gain new perspectives and knowledge and understanding about yourself and the way our brain works and this was basically, I mean, this is what a drug does. It takes you out of your normal thinking about the world and the normal way that you process and evaluate your perceptions. And it totally throws you into a completely different way. And it's not that this new way of seeing the world in itself that is so enlightening. It's just a different way of seeing the world. That what is so enlightening is the fact that you have a a different perspective. It just opens up a whole new dimension. From this new perspective, you can look back at your old perspective and see what was crazy about it. So that concept is the same thing we're working with here in general semantics with the tools of extension. I'll get into that. We haven't talked about extension yet in Korzybski's tools of extension but we'll talk about that but first let's just I want to just talk about again this idea the map is not the territory that that was Korzybski's most famous saying language is a map our abstractions are maps of the world they're models of the world we use language to map out our world and maps are they're useful in virtue of their limited information they limit information just imagine a map that contained every single detail of the territory that it was mapping. If you think about it, if it contained every single detail, it would have to cover the entire, it would be the same size as the territory it represented. You would have to walk around the map, find your way, walk, you know, five blocks over this way to see over here. It can't contain everything. It limits it. It abstracts it. And the it doesn't show what's actually there it doesn't show all the grains of sand it doesn't show all the dirt all the animals all whatever it there's infinite amount of things you could say that it doesn't talk about but what it does talk about are certain structural features of that land so that it's useful by virtue of its structural similarity 